Here's a probability question. If you throw a dart at a mystery object A and your accuracy isn't great, what's the chance you'll hit it? There's a totally obvious answer. You throw lots of darts and you just count the fraction of your darts that hit A. Let's dress it up more formally. Let x be the random variable describing the location of a random dart and let x1 up to xn be samples drawn from x. Then the probability of hitting A is roughly the fraction of the xi that lie in A. Here I've written it with indicator function notation. 1 sub xi in A is equal to 1 if xi is in A and 0, 0 if xi is not in A. So this expression on the right just counts up the number of darts that hit A. Indicator functions are really useful for turning Boolean conditions into algebra that you can do maths with. Because they're random samples, they may or may not be representative, which is why I've written probability that x in A is approximately this average. So why am I telling you about this blindingly obvious idea and dressing it up in fancy notation? This is actually a special case of a general method called Monte Carlo approximation. And this general method is the basis for pretty much all modern probabilistic machine learning. We're going to be using a version of it in the next video to do Bayes rule by computer for when the math is intractable. And we'll be using it in many other ways in the rest of this course. There's an extra example in the printed notes showing how Monte Carlo approximation can help train a neural network to generate synthetic images. Before going on to the general method, I just want to make a quick point about coding. Here's an example of Monte Carlo code. I'm told a random variable x, in this case normally distributed, and I want the probability of an event, in this case the event that x is larger than 5. Here's how I'd implement it in NumPy. I generate a sample of x values, say 10,000 of them. Why 10,000, you may wonder? You can actually estimate a sensible number by using the central limit theorem, but that's outside the scope of this course, so it's left to the lecture notes. Then I test whether the sampled x values meet the condition that I'm interested in. This is NumPy, and x is a vector, so this must be a vectorized operation i is a vector of 10,000 boolean values. I want to sum up the indicator function and divide by n. In other words, find the mean of all those indicators. NumPy will automatically typecast booleans to integers, so all I need to type is numpy.mean of i. If you didn't know anything about Monte Carlo and you weren't very familiar with NumPy, you might look at this code, not even spot the 10,000 there and wonder what on earth it's doing. We'll be using Monte Carlo a lot in this course because it's the backbone of computational probabilistic machine learning. So we really need to be able to write fast and efficient code for it. This is just three lines of code. Don't go around writing silly for loops or list comprehensions because it will take you longer to code and it'll take the computer longer to execute. You can really see from this where NumPy has its strengths. The whole point of vectorized calculation in NumPy and all the syntactical sugar that comes with it is to make it so this sort of computation is easy to write and blindingly fast. OK, so now let's state the general version of Monte Carlo. The general version is actually written as a statement about expectations, not probabilities. So first, let's remind ourselves about expectation. The expected value of a random variable x is the sum or integral of x times the likelihood of x where x ranges over the sample space, i.e. over all possible values. This only makes sense if x is a real valued random variable, because we need to add up and multiply sample values little x. But for interesting probability models, we'd like to work with rich complicated random things, like random faces or random text strings, so it's more useful to use a different version of expectation. Here, x is an arbitrary random variable, and h, we might call it the readout function, is a function that maps x to a real number. Then the expected value of h of x is given by the obvious sum or integral. Now, the general form of the Monte Carlo approximation 
is just this. We can approximate the expected value of h of x by just sampling some values from x, called our samples x1 up to xn, applying h to each of them and taking the mean. This is the Monte Carlo approximation. It's also called Monte Carlo integration because it's a way to evaluate an integral, at least for the continuous case. Let's link this general form back to the probability estimation that we opened with. It's all about choosing the random variable x and the readout function h. Here, we're told what x to use, so it's just a matter of inventing the right h. I shall let h of x be the indicator that x is in a. Incidentally, just a point about notation, this is just me defining a plain simple function that maps an arbitrary value little x to a real number, so the definition of h has little x in it, it doesn't have the random variable big x in it. The Monte Carlo approximation says that the expected value of h of big x, i.e. the expected value of this indicator function, is roughly the mean of the indicator function applied to all our sample values, little x sub i. Okay, so we've got the right-hand side of what we wanted. But what does the expectation of an indicator function have to do with probabilities? This actually relies on a very nice little trick with indicator functions. There's a fundamental link between expectations and probabilities via indicator functions. Let's say, let y be the indicator that x is in a. Here x is a random variable, and so y is a random variable too. Then, by definition of expectation, the first simpler definition of expectation that we saw, the expected value of y is the sum over all the values it can take of little y times the likelihood of little y. y is an indicator, so it only takes two values, zero and one. So all we're left with is the probability that y equals 1, which is nothing other than the probability that x is an a. So this is the link between the naive obvious way of estimating probabilities and the general statement of Monte Carlo integration. It all comes down to picking a good random variable x and a good readout function h. The exercises will ask you to think creatively about how to pick x and h for some other problems. Let's look at one more plain old vanilla integration example. Let's imagine we have a function h of x and we want to integrate it over a range a to b. This is probably how you learnt about integration way back in secondary school. Split the x-axis into intervals, draw a rectangle for each interval. The width of each interval is b minus a divided by n, because there are n of them. And so the area of each rectangle is h of xi times the width where the xi are the midpoints of each of the intervals. So, summing up the areas of each of the rectangles tells us the area under the curve. The larger n is, the better the approximation. Let's try to reframe this as a probability problem. I'm going to propose a random variable x uniformly distributed in the range a to b. The Monte Carlo approximation tells us the expected value of h of x can be approximated by the sample mean of h of little xi, where the xi's are samples from this uniform distribution. Let's just unpack the expectation. It's an integral, the integral of h of x times the probability density function, and because x is a simple uniform random variable, the PDF is just 1 on b minus a. So, if we just rearrange our Monte Carlo approximation, multiplying each side by b minus a, we get back to something very similar to the classic split into rectangles formula. The only difference is that the classic formula insists on picking the xi evenly spaced across the interval, whereas our Monte Carlo version says we can just pick the xi randomly wherever we like, as long as it's uniform over the range. This bottom version is called Monte Carlo integration. The name Monte Carlo is a bit dumb. It's just, hey, this method's random. Do you know what else is random? Gambling. Do you know where they have lots of gambling? In Monte Carlo. So I think we should rename the standard type of integration. Let's call it Trinity College integration in honor of Isaac Newton. 
OK, we've looked at two ways of applying Monte Carlo. I just want to talk very briefly about one more. This will just be words, I won't go into the maths. Let's think about computer graphics and ray tracing. Suppose I want to render a 3D scene. Let's work out, for some particular pixel on the screen, call it P, how it should be coloured. First, we figure out which 3D object the user is seeing through pixel P. Let's say that the user sees some point Q on some object in the 3D world. Next, we look at the light sources that are illuminating Q. From every point on every light source, I can imagine a ray of light that might hit Q. Each point X will also send rays all over the place, but I'm working the, out the illumination at Q, so I'm only going to consider the rays that hit Q. Any ray that hits Q will be reflected, usually in a range of directions, depending on the material that this object is made of, but I'm interested in the illumination as seen by the user, so I'm only interested in the rays that hit P. If I work out the amount of illumination sent from X to Q, and the fraction of that that's reflected towards P, I get the illumination at P due to X. If the light source is an area light source, not a point, then I have to integrate over all points X and add up their contributions to get the total illumination at P. Now, the Monte Carlo idea is simply Whenever you see an integral, replace it by a random sample. In other words, we'll randomly sample points on the light source and average their contributions. The more samples we take, the better the approximation will get. This raises the question, how many samples do we need to get a good approximation? There are actually two ways to answer this. One way is we go off and use some probability theory, in this case, the central limit theorem, and that can tell us how much inaccuracy there is in the Monte Carlo approximation. Basically, the error decreases as one on the square root of n, and there's where n is the number of samples we're using, and there's a constant factor which we can estimate. But there's another answer which is much smarter. This is to say, hold on, if we cunningly tweak our sampling, if we don't sample uniformly but instead use some biased sampling, then we could get away with fewer samples. This cunning trick is called important sampling. We're not going to get into either answer for the time being. The job that we're interested in right now is Bayes' rule, and then next video we'll talk about how we can use the Monte Carlo approximation for solving Bayes' rule problems, using computers to get approximate answers rather than struggling through integrals.